Well, good morning. Good morning, church family. We are so excited to have you guys here this morning. Just kind of giving you guys a few uh, key details. Number one, we do have coffee and donuts in the back. Feel free even right now if you would like to get up and get some of that because we're going to get started here in just a minute. Also, obviously, hopefully you know where the bathrooms are. Either way, they're to the sides, out these side doors and out the rear doors if you would like some of those. Um, however, we are so excited to be opening up our Parenting Forward Conference. We've got a special guest speaker uh, that's going to be here with us this morning and another one that's going to be with us in the next hour. We really hope that you guys have, have come ready to, to kind of hear. I hope you've come with kind of open hearts, maybe even ready to take some notes, because trust me, the things that Mr. Jonathan McKee and Dr. Alan Branch are going to be talking about are going to be very key for, for you as parents and grandparents raising the next generation. And that's really what this conference is all about. We want to help give you guys some practical tips and equip you as, as, our, as our church family to be able to make key and wise decisions in the things that you do, in how you talk with your kid or grandkid, in how you lead and parent moving forward. So this morning, real fast, we've got Jonathan McKee, one of our speakers. He's going to be coming up here in just a moment talking about less is more, and he'll tell you all about that. However, just some key facts about him real quick. He has written over 20 books on the topics of parenting and, and, and kids and students. Um, some of these books are going to be at a table right here in the lobby that you can peruse and even uh, purchase if you would desire. And you can talk to him, even find him at that table after this session. So make sure to make use of that. However, Jonathan's coming all the way from California. So this man is running on zero sleep. And don't worry, he is still energetic. So he's going he's gonna to hopefully come up in just a moment and really kind of dive us into our parenting forward conference and if you have any questions feel free to catch them afterwards all right so let me do this for us i'm going to pray for us real quick and then jonathan mckee is going to come on come on up and, and talk to us so let's pray in the name of the true Lord Jesus Christ, God, we thank you so much that you are good and that you do great things. Father, that you have not left us alone, even as parents and grandparents, but you have given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to be able to point us to the scriptures and give us wisdom and guidance and clarity. And right now, God, I, I pray that you would fill Jonathan McKee to speak truth into our lives where we are right now. Father, I pray that every single person in this room, that they would, that they would leave here changed with, a, with a, a little more detail than they had when they walked in, with a little more clarity than they had when they walked in, Father, filled with the Spirit, given direction on how we can better interact with our kids and grandkids. Father God, we trust you for everything you're going to do today throughout the whole conference, and we're excited to see what that is. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonathan McKee. Thank you, AJ. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So, uh, yeah, he said I'm from California. So welcome to the 7.15 a.m. service. It's good to be here. This is great. I'm, I'm so excited. Thank you so much uh, for having me. It's going to be a fun day. I'm looking forward to this morning as we talk a little bit and open up God's word. And then this afternoon as we dive deeper uh, for my Parenting Generation Screen workshop. So pretty excited about this. Um, last, uh, uh, just a little while ago, I was conducting some field research um, about a book I was writing, and I was on a middle school campus, and I was in a classroom, and I had 13 or 14 middle school kids. These kids were 11 to 14 years old. And I decided to try something, so what I did is I pulled out my phone, and I said, I'll tell you what, we're going to play a game. Everybody whip out your phone. And they didn't know, I was just kind of doing a little test right there. Because see, I've done the research, and I've seen all the different research of at what age kids get phones, and I knew exactly at what age they get them, and the average was, I knew that when it comes to high school kids, about 89% of them have smartphones in their back pocket. And I knew when it came to middle school kids, 69% of them have smartphones in their back pocket. But when I said, hey, everybody pull out your phones, of these 14 middle school kids, which was a pretty good cross-section of the school, it wasn't necessarily a rich school, it wasn't necessarily a poor school, it was a pretty good just mix, every single kid whipped out a smartphone. Now, it's funny because a lot of us as parents, our kids have come up to us and they've said, mom... 
all my friends have smartphones, right? How many of you guys heard it? All my friends have smartphones, you know? Come on, mom, please. And we, you know, and, and it's interesting to see this happen, but, but I thought, okay, I just want to test this out a little bit. So I said, okay, uh, pull your smartphone out here, and what we're going to do is we're going to play a game called Speed Text. I'm going to say something and uh, that, that you text me, and I literally went over to the whiteboard. I wrote my phone number. Maybe this was a little brave of me. I'm not sure. I wrote my phone number on the whiteboard. I said, put me in your phone, and I'm going to name something for you to text me. And the first person that gets 10 of these, boom, and I pulled out a Starbucks gift card. I'm like, gets this $10 Starbucks gift card. So the kids had their phones out. I was in their system. And the first thing I said is I said, okay, I want your first and last name and a selfie. And the kids were immediately like, tink, <laughs> And my phone starts blowing up with all these faces right there on my phone. First and last name. Boom. It was there. I said, okay, uh, favorite restaurant. Kids were like, boom, immediately. Taco Bell, Taco Bell, In-N-Out Burger, California. You know, and all these, you know, boom, all their favorite food just coming, popping up, populating my phone. You know, I said, a picture of your shoes. So immediately, poof, chucks checkered vans, you know, all these pictures, just boom, again, phone blowing up, and I'm sitting there doing this now, and by the way, youth workers, like Adrian, is sitting there going, hey, this is, a, this is a good way, if you want all the kids' contact number, you now got their name, number, pictures, you got what, it's funny, you start just learn a little bit, so then, just, I just started slipping in, I said, I want to see a picture of the app that you most recently used, and immediately, boom, they screenshotted the picture of all these apps, and I'm seeing Snapchat, I'm seeing Instagram, I've got middle school boys there, so I've seen like Fortnite, you know, seen a lot of TikTok, all this different stuff, and what they didn't realize is I was starting to learn a little bit about every one of these kids, because you can learn a lot about a young person, by looking at their phone. It's funny, in the youth ministry world, I've been in youth ministry for three decades now, they used to say, if you want to learn about a kid, say, just look around his room at the posters on his wall and look at, you know, or they'd say, look at his t-shirt, what's right on front on his t-shirt right there. Now, if you want to get to know a kid, just look no further than this device right there. So then what's funny is I said something. I said, okay, now I want to see a screenshot of the song you most recently played. And boom, all of a sudden, we're starting to see all these songs on there. Cardi B, Billie Eilish, seeing the little Ariana, little Post Malone, you know. Uh, and as they're doing this, I'm kind of getting a glimpse into their world. Because this device that they carry around in their back pocket um, it's interesting, you know, as, as they're talking about this thing, and, and as they talk about themselves and stuff, you get kind of a glimpse. But when you start seeing what is the entertainment media that they're soaking in every day, what music are they listening to, what apps are they on, it tells you a lot about their world. So when I finished, a, uh, you know, one of the kids won. I'm like, all right, Chris won. I gave him the card. And then I tried something that, by the way, teachers are always asking, hey, should we or should we not let kids use phones in the classroom? So the approach I tried was I played a game with a phone, but then when I was done with the game, I said, hey, let's do something. Let's put our phones in the pockets for a second. Let's, just, let's put them in our pockets. And all 14 kids put their phones in their pockets. And I said, I'm kind of curious. Let me just ask you some questions. And I said, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I noticed, you know, all you had smartphones. When did you guys get these smartphones? Now, I was asking that question because, again, I do the research, and I know that in this country, the average age in which a young person gets a smartphone is 10 years old, despite the fact that experts are saying, wait till much later. And a lot of these kids here were like, oh, I've had it for years. I've got 12-year-olds sitting there talking about, oh, I got it. And it seemed right about what's average, you know. Some of them were like, oh, when my dad got his new phone, I got his old phone. You know, so I'm starting to hear about when they got their phones. So then I said, hey, I noticed a lot of you, you sent me pictures of social media. You know, your TikTok, your Instagram, your Snapchat stuff. Hey, when did you first get social media? And immediately they're like, oh, I got it last year. Oh, I've had it a couple different years, you know. And it was interesting to me because as they were talking about that, I'm in my mind doing the math of when they first had it. And I said, well, I've got another question real quick. Um, when you first signed up for social media, how many of you guys knew you were going to have to lie about your age? And immediately got really quiet. And they kind of looked at each other like, he knows, you know. But one kid's all, 
Oh, my brother told me I was going to have to. I kept my birth date the same day and month, but I just lied about the year. That way my friends would still know my birthday, you know. And the other friends are like, oh, I totally knew about it. You know, now, of course, what I was talking about is something that they probably really never read the research on, but the FTC made this rule that Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and all these basically can't collect information from anyone under 13 years old. It's called COPA, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. And what that does is that means when a young person goes to sign up for Snapchat, the first thing that Snapchat does is it asks and says, you know, enter your birthday right here. So the kid enters their birthday, and if they enter their birth year truthfully and they're only 11 years old, it says, oh, I'm sorry. You have to get, and it proposes something else for kids, basically. And they're like, oh, and if a kid didn't know better, a kid would go to school and be like, oh, I tried to sign up, but I couldn't because I'm not old enough. And that kid's friends would be like, hey, stupid, uh, just change the year. I can do that? Yeah, it's simple. You just lie, but just change another. And sure enough, all you do is you just, nobody's monitoring it. You just choose another year and poof, you're magically 13. It's amazing. Just like that. And so many young people do this because it's no big deal. I mean, everybody's doing it. And I even said to them, I said, hey, how many of you, your parents knew you lied about your age? And most of them were like, oh, they knew it's no big deal because, you know, my brother had had it. My sister had had it. One kid said, Well, my mom said, it's okay, but just make sure that you don't do anything stupid. And I thought, well, that's good. She had the talk with him. She handed him a device and said, here's all you need to know. Don't do anything stupid. I mean, if only we handled driver's licenses like that, right? When our 12-year-old asked for the keys to the car, we should just throw him the keys to the SUV and be like, don't do anything stupid. Enough said, right? That's all they need. But for some reason, we just toss our kids these devices because we think to ourselves, I don't know much about it. They know more about it than me. So we hand it to them. Forget wisdom. Forget principles about like, who should I and shouldn't I talk with? What should I stream? What should I post? Regardless of how I'm starting to feel about what I post. I'm not here today to tell you that this thing's bad or this is evil. This device is actually very handy. During COVID, a lot of us realized that this device was our connection to family and friends. Today, this device brought me here. It said, turn left, turn right. This nice little female voice, turn right, turn left. And most of us guys are used to a female voice telling us, turn right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just threw that out. But but I mean, so I mean, this, this device is... Very helpful. Morning, I'm going to read scripture, and you know what I'm going to go ahead and do just to prove that this device is bad? I'm going to read it right off this device. I've got these really cool Bible apps on this device. It's interesting. This device, like a vehicle, can be used for good. But if we don't know how to use it, if we're driving too fast, if we're drinking and driving, if we're speeding, if we've got distractions going on, we're not paying attention to the road, then, then vehicle in the wrong hands could be bad. And what if we just taught our kids to become screen wise? I think what a lot of us are going to find out is that some of us, we live in homes where we're so focused on screens, we're so distracted by screens that it's starting to interfere with other areas of our lives. And it's not that those screens are necessarily evil, but maybe we haven't really learned. Maybe this happened so fast that we haven't learned how to become screen wise. And today I'm going to just propose something simple, and that is that maybe less would be more. Because as I sat in a room with middle school kids and asked them questions about their lives and their phones, what became very apparent very quickly was that these young people had access to all kinds of stuff that their parents had no idea of what they had access to. They had very little boundaries. The overwhelming majority of them brought their phone into their night, into their bedroom for all night, each night despite what experts are recommending, and their parents didn't have a clue what was going on. And I remember asking myself, how did we get here? How did we get here? So let's take a quick little history lesson. 
Let's go back to 2007. In January of 2007, a guy wearing jeans and white sneakers walked out on a stage and he made an announcement that changed the world. In January of 2007, before then, if young people had wanted to be on social media, they usually were on a device attached to a wall. And then if they wanted to do entertainment, it was usually another system hooked to a TV. If they wanted to text, it was on this little phone that they could text or talk, talking, which they rarely did, texting, which they did a lot of. And if they wanted little entertainment, music they listened to, that kind of stuff, that was on yet another device called like an iPod or an iTouch. So most young people had access to pretty much four different devices for these different things. In January 2007, this guy makes an announcement that basically all those things were now available on one device. And let me tell you how fast things change. By all of a sudden, 2012, in just five years, America crosses the 50% mark for smartphone ownership. Because not only that device, but other devices by other manufacturers. And yes, there was a few lawsuits about whose device it really was and whose idea it was. It doesn't matter. The country was like, I don't care. Just give me that. And by 2012, all of a sudden, the majority of Americans, and by the end of 2012, the majority of teenagers now had a smartphone in their pocket. Now had social media in their pocket. And what do we start doing? We started, you know, playing Angry Birds, and immediately, what do our kids say? Mom, Mom, Dad, 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 can I play Angry Birds? And before we know it, we start seeing kids with these devices. And again, we live in a country where the average age that a young person now gets a smartphone is 10 years old. It's not uncommon to see very young kids with a device in their hand. Because we've learned a long time ago that, hey, our kids behave a lot better if you just hand them a screen. And so is it any surprising that when those kids grow up, they're still staring at screens in the back seat instead of necessarily having a conversation? And this has changed the workplace where there used to be conversation before a meeting. Often there ain't, you know. This has changed school. This has changed the way young people live their lives because now you don't just enjoy the event. You have to post about the event. Even if you're by yourself, it's immediately like, hmm, is this the, perf the perfect insta-perfect picture here so I could just quickly take a picture of this moment to make sure, you know, that other people see what I'm doing and, and, and then I could see what other people think. And it's amazing when you start really studying this stuff because uh, when it comes to Generation Z, uh, which is right now about 25 and below, for a lot of them, so much is about what you're posting about yourself that you'll sit there and read interviews where a lot of people are sitting there saying, oh, you know what, I can't post that pic right now because I already wore that outfit and I posted a pic with me in that outfit and I don't want them to think I just have one outfit. So I can't wear that outfit today because I'm going to, you know, post something. So I've got to be very careful. So very often people will take selfies wherever they're going and also now their lives, what they're wearing, everything is governed by these selfies. It's interesting. Just a couple months ago, there was an article in USA Today about what are you really looking for on your phone? Author Sherry Turkle, uh, who's written several books, uh, one called Reclaiming Conversation, and talking about how the phone is changing the way we conversate uh, with each other. And she said when people pick up their phones, they look for different things. Some people want to feel valued. Some want to feel that they have influence. Some search for camaraderie. The phone is becoming a place of finding ourselves. She goes on and says, there used to be all these places and spaces that held our imagination. Now, more and more, we're turning to our phones for these feelings. So these phones are now kind of changing the way we do things. We're out. Let's post about it. But here's something that hasn't been talked about much. And this is the thing that when I go to a school and talk in a school assembly, when I go and talk to parents, this is the subject that everybody's scratching their head and they can't figure out because what people weren't talking about, and honestly, I think some of these app developers, sure, we've all seen the Netflix special maybe, you know, they were developing how much time can I get them to stay on this app, you know, and all that. That's what they were trying. I don't know if their intention was some of this unforeseen consequences afterwards of after you post, the feeling you got of, well, 
How come I didn't get as many likes as Jake got? How come I don't have as many followers as Christine? There's that post post time. There's that time after the selfie that we aren't really talking about with our kids. There's the time after we post it where we're sitting around waiting for the thing that everybody wants. I mean, who doesn't want to be liked? And sadly, what we're seeing is we're seeing that this is affecting young people a lot more than anybody predicted. And all the research out there is crystal clear that there is this startling increase in depression right now. And again, researchers are scratching their heads about it. Suicide has spiked more than ever before. Depression, anxiety. And a lot of people are kind of looking for, you know, who to blame for this depression. Now, it's interesting when you look, because obviously a lot of different people are speculating. I found this chart by the CDC pretty interesting. This chart, the bluish, purplish line, is suicide in America, and the green line is homicide in America. Uh, It's interesting because... Suicide, if you look right there, boom, there's 2007, the year the iPhone was introduced. All of a sudden, the smartphone started getting in people's pockets. By 2012, right there, that's all of a sudden when the majority of America had a smartphone in their pocket. And 2012 is an important year with technology because not only is that the year that America crossed the 50% mark, that's the year Snapchat got in young people's pockets. That's the year Instagram became overwhelmingly popular and got in young people's pockets. So in 2012, and by the way, my kids who are now grown, my daughters were both in high school at 2012, and they saw a shift. They saw a shift in communication. Since 2012, suicide took a spike. And a lot of this depression and stuff, experts are sitting there, they're talking about it, and they're noticing it. And some of the experts are just coming right out and saying it. As a matter of fact, Dr. Jean Twinge, the author of iGen, she's saying, hey, guess what? Teen depression is up. Suicide's up, and so is smartphone use, and there is a very clear connection. And experts going into COVID, pre-COVID, mind you, as as 2019 going to 20, they were sitting there going, hey, something's going on with the way young people feel about themselves. Then all of a sudden, COVID moves in, and boom, all of a sudden, it's catalyzing something different. And it was interesting because in one way, COVID did something and brought something to light that maybe wasn't so evident before, and that was the importance of interpersonal relationships. Because all of a sudden, young people who are now spending more time, think about this, more screen time communicating with people via screens, but all of a sudden, they're less satisfied with their personal relationships and with communication. As a matter of fact, some experts describe it as the loneliest generation, lonelier. Because all of a sudden, young people, you start hearing them say, I want to get out of this house. I want to get with my friends. They realized the importance of face-to-face relationships. Something we all speculated about and a lot of us knew about, but COVID was making it pretty clear. And during COVID, sadly, we saw some mental health things starting to arise. We saw suicide go up even more because, of course, all the COVID stuff. And it's during times like that that sometimes we sit there and just go, you know what? All this technology, sure, it helps us at time, but could I just ask a question? Is there a chance that perhaps less is more? Is there a chance that less is more? There's some people who actually add up all the hours when it comes to entertainment media. There's people that add it up. The Common Sense Media is one of those people, and they sit there and they take over the Kaiser Foundation's uh, research. Kaiser Foundation used to do this entertainment media report, and now Common Sense Media does it. And when they add it up in their most recent report, exactly how much time, and oh man, they got a big old chart that shows they add up TV time, internet time, all the YouTube, all the Snapchat, all the, you know, they name it. Add it all up. Teenagers, I'll just give you the, the bottom line. Nine hours and 49 minutes a day, that's the average. That's the average. Pre-COVID, TV went up during COVID. A lot of Netflix streaming during COVID, right? You know? Like, what'd you do today? I watched season one of Parks and Rec. (laughs) All season one, you know? Uh, A lot of streaming happening, so those numbers went up. But it's interesting because nine hours and 49 minutes, and we also live in a country where despite your family doctor's recommendation, 
79% of young people bring their phone into their bedroom every night. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been clear about that piece of advice for decades. Your family doctor has said, hey, hey well, whatever you do, screens, all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of debate, but here's one thing that's not debatable. Uh, the bedroom is one of those places that you don't need a screen. So just don't know. And they used to say 20 years ago, no TV in the bedrooms. Then it was 10 years ago, no internet in the bedrooms. And, and now it's like no phones in the bedrooms. How many parents do you know that are standing outside their kid's bedroom with a bucket saying, okay, please deposit your screens into the bucket before you go to bed tonight? Matter of fact, some of the young people that are even in this room right now are really nervous. They're like, oh no, he's talking about this. I hope my mom doesn't take away the phone in the bedroom. Sorry about that. Um, it's just one of those things. A lot of parents aren't taking that advice for one reason or another. Eight out of ten young people bring their phones into their bedrooms every night. Now, here's an interesting thing. Here's something that nobody's talking about. This little device right here, there's certain apps that young people get on, and there's a number right there on that app that is changing everything. Now, what I'm talking about this morning, I'm talking about something completely different this afternoon. It's a completely different session. My Parenting Generation screen workshop. But let me give you a quick little preview of something I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Just a peek. And that is on this little device right here. If you jump on your typical social media, like you jump on Instagram. If you jump on Instagram, there's a little number right there that is changing the world today. And it's that number right there. That number right there is changing everything. It's changing the way young people feel about themselves. It's changing the way young people navigate online relationships. And that is a number that's usually called something like friends or followers. That number has become very important recently, and there's not a lot of people talking about this. And we're going to talk about it this afternoon. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because we have a generation that if you pull them, and Y Post does a lot of pulling of Gen Z and Gen Y, and they ask them, and they ask them, like, you know, uh, you know what they like and what they're watching. One of the most popular things that young people like to watch are funny videos on YouTube, funny videos on TikTok. And something that's a byproduct of that, because that's literally one of their favorite things to do, is watch these funny videos. And some of these are innocent, fun videos. These guys right here are actually a bunch of Christian guys who make funny videos. They're actually very innocent videos. But the interesting thing about this is the more young people are watching these videos, the more young people are sitting there going, I, I could do that. Do you know that 72% of Gen Z says that they specifically want to be an online celeb? 72%. Uh... Now, from stage left, let's please welcome the influencer. Influencer was a word of year a couple years ago. The word influencer is starting to arise. What is an influencer? Let me tell you what an influencer is. An influencer is now what 86% of young people want to be. My friend Julie is a, a third and fourth grade teacher. And she says, Jonathan, that number right there is spot on. She says, we do this thing with our third and fourth graders where they can be the star of the week. And the star of the week, we focus on them, and we give them all the attention for the week. And they tell us about their parents, about their pets. We, they have a poster with all their different stuff. And there's one part of star of the week where they come and they say, here's what I want to be when I grow up. And it used to always be, I want to be a policeman. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a dolphin trainer, right? All the fun things that kids want to be. And she says, now, hands down, 8 out of 10, I want to be a YouTuber. I want to be an Insta celeb. Eight out of 10. And 86% of young people want to be in its love. Let me tell you why that's important. All of a sudden, that number right there becomes very important. Because if you want to be an Insta celeb, that number right there means that when you're on any of these platforms right here, if you're, there's one thing you're trying to do right now, get followers. So now all of a sudden, we're very... Uh, in particular, about what kind of followers we're getting. Matter of fact, we try to open it up for, as, you know, anybody. We leave our profiles even on public. But if mom and dad said, no, you have to have your profiles on private, which means then people actually have to ask to follow you. If that is, then they're sitting there and here's their screening process. Okay, a guy named Ted Bundy wants to follow me. Yes, Ted, thank you. <laughs> yes, another follower. I need him because I want to be an influencer. Eight out of ten young people. They need more followers. Not to mention, that little number right there, that little number right there that, uh, that um, 
is got all you know that represents all these apps that number uh also makes us feel better about ourselves i've got more followers here's how many followers i have now they might have read an article somewhere and this is a little aside when i go and do school assemblies one of the things i talk to young people about is self-esteem and so we end up talking about this influencer culture because so much of who they are now is wrapped into this influencer culture and many young wannabe influencers have read an article out there that all you need is 500 followers. If you could have 500 followers, you could be an influencer because they read an article that that's all you need. Yeah, it's a little more than that. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's talk about 500,000 for a quick second followers, okay? Uh, when it comes down to it, and I talk with young people, I say, hey, I, I'm not here to be a dream crusher. I'm here to just give you information so you keep your options open, okay? So anybody here in this room that's thinking of being an influencer, here's what I tell young people to school assembly. I say, just keep your options open. Because let me just show you real quick, when it comes to 500,000 followers, the research out there is saying, how much uh, do YouTubers actually make? If you look and it goes down to how many people are able to actually quit their job and full-time be a YouTuber, uh, when you look at the numbers, the number of how many followers you need, pretty much the one that most people agree on is you need about a million followers. Okay, you need a million. Um, and article after article say success begins in a million. Now, you'll find different articles put out by people that are trying to market and get your money and do different stuff saying, you only need 500. You could, and they'll tell the story of somebody who got some free makeup because they had 500 followers or whatever like that. And, and that's great. If you want some free makeup, that, that's cool. But I'm talking for those kids that are like, Mom, Dad, I'm forfeiting my uh, first year of college. I'm going to give this YouTube thing a try. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that now. You're hearing that all the time. Every parent workshop I do, a mom comes up to me and goes, so my kid doesn't want to go to college because they're going to give the influencing thing a try, okay? Now, it's interesting because when it comes to this, you interview people, and I do this research. This is what I do. I've got kind of a boring job. I'm a social researcher, all right? And I research this stuff, and it's interesting. The people out there that are out, like here is this uh, marketing hub interviewed this YouTuber named Dunn who started a YouTube channel with a friend. He currently had 700,000 subscribers. And the way Dunn described it was that despite the success, we're not, we're, excuse me, he says, despite the success, we're just barely scraping by. Brands think we're too small to sponsor, but fans think we're too big for donations. So at that point, that 700,000 mark just wasn't enough to be able to really make it. And again, it gets back to that million number. Now, when you do the math, how many people are actually able to hit that when it comes to YouTubers and TikTokers and stuff? The number is about 1 in 2,252. So here's what I do at a school assembly. I love it when I got a school with about 2,000 people there. I say, everybody, stand up real quick. I go, okay, now, remain standing if your birthday is, and I have the birthday there, it's, it's like between January 1st and I think it's like October 22nd. I say, you stay standing. Everybody else sit down. And I go, right here, and you've got the majority of the room. You have, guess what? 86% of the room standing. And I sit there and say, this is how many of you would like to be an influencer. I go, now, please, if your birthday is May 4th from the hours of 12 a.m. to 5 a.m., please stay standing. And sometimes in a big school, one kid will end up still remaining. She's like, I think it was in the morning, you know, whatever. You're like, oh, thank you. What's your name? Tiffany. All right. Hey, everybody, look at Tiffany. Tiffany's the one person in the school who will be able to do it full time, statistically, if this room represents America. Give Tiffany a hand. Yeah, you're an influencer. And very often, in a town, in a big school, they'll be like, I know a kid. I know someone, right? Because that's the numbers. One, two thousand, two hundred and two. Now, here's the crazy thing. A lot of kids are forfeiting college. So I like to give them a little bit of money. I spend time where I actually talk about, I show them the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and I, I talk about average annual salary, and I just show them the difference between um, uh, high school, you know, the average salary with a high school diploma and with a college degree. And I just kind of show them some of those numbers just to kind of get them to be thinking about college. And then I talk to them a little bit about trade school, too. And I say, hey, maybe if college isn't for you, let me tell you something. And I talk about, like, the electrician that came to my house and how much he made. And if he wanted to make funny electrician videos on the side, who knows? Maybe he'll be one in 2,252 you know, who can do that. But we need to talk with kids about this. 
because very often they aren't hearing anything about it. Um, the other thing is, what happens when you're trying to do this and it's not working out for you? Which, for about 85.5%, that's the reality. So, what happens when that happens? Um, ask Sam Benarak, who had 166,000 followers on TikTok, but purposely took a break from it because of the anxiety it was giving him when his likes were dropping on any given day. He said, not getting the numbers that you want is so harmful, it's scary because it's like this spiral of never feeling like you're enough and that leaves this mental scarring. It's contributed to my mental health not being the best lately and I definitely had to get some therapy because of this. And these are the things that a lot of us aren't talking about. These are the things we need to be a little bit aware of when it comes to this little device that's in our back pocket because a whole lot of us, our lives are being changed by this device we carry around in our pockets. Um, the average adult is awake 16 hours. Um, and if he's awake 16 hours, the average adult spends, ready for it, on average, 11 hours of entertainment media. Yeah, you got young people beat. It's true. Uh, you think teenagers watch a lot of TV? You know who watches more TV than teenagers? My generation. You know who watches more TV than my generation? My dad's generation. Man, he loves Matlock. We need an NCIS in every city. I'm waiting for NCIS Memphis. Forget that. NCIS Collierville. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. You know, we love our screens. And if you look at the typical American house, picture what this looks like. I mean, honestly, let's start looking at all the screens. You've got the big TV in the main room. You've got the big TV in the bedroom. Then you've got, of course, your smartphone. But then everybody in the family also uh, has a smartphone. So you add up all those smartphones. Then, of course, there's that uh, family iPad. And there's the game system that your son plays. Of course, he's playing that on the old TV that's down in the basement, right? And then we've got the old iTouches that you forgot about that your kids still have. And when you said no phones in the bedroom because you're part of the 21% that said no phones in the bedroom, they dug that out of the drawer and downloaded Snapchat on that. And you don't even realize that they're on Snapchat that night on that. Not you, of course, young lady. Uh, and uh, then there's a little device that we can wear on our wrist. And, also, I mean, and, and if you think about this, I mean, if you walk into the typical American home at 7 o'clock at night, dad's watching TV, mom's sitting next to dad scrolling through social media while maybe kind of paying attention to TV. Sister's upstairs in the bedroom, definitely on social media. Brother is staring at a screen, sitting there, you know, playing games. Toddlers on the ground with a family iPad flicking colors across the screen. And the dog is on the treadmill because no one will walk him. He's like, please, I want to go outside. And we're like, that's what we got technology for. Get on the treadmill, Rover. Fine. Stupid screens. That's a typical American home. It's not that screens are bad, but is there a chance that less could be more? Um, I'm going to open up my screen right now, and I'm going to open the Bible. If you've got a Bible, I encourage you to open to it. And I'd love you to open up to Luke chapter 10. Because I just want to ask a question. It's not that screens are bad. It's not that screens are evil. I just want to ask this question. Is it too much? Are there some unforeseen consequences to being so overconnected that we don't connect anymore? What's the answer? Are we so overconnected with our screens that now we're so wrapped up in the people outside of the room that we're ignoring the people inside the room? Hey, a phone is a great tool for connecting with people outside the room when you don't ignore the people inside the room. Is there a chance that we're a little overconnected? Is there a chance that every once in a while we should just take this device and stick it in the back pocket? Uh, in Luke chapter 10, um, starting at verse 38, Jesus goes to the home of Martha and Mary. 
And this passage has never been more relevant than today. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Most scholars, by the way, think that this is the same Mary that was the same woman that came and just a little bit earlier in the book fell at Jesus' feet and cleaned Jesus' hair, uh, his feet with her hair. So here she is at his feet again. And as she's there just soaking it up, look what happens. It says, and so sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listen to what he said, and here we go, verse 40. But Martha was, what's the next word? Distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by herself? Tell her to help me. No, just pause right there. Just hit the pause button right there on that passage. Now think about this. Martha was distracted. Now, these sisters saw Jesus out in the town. They had, they had possibly experienced a little bit of him. They had run into him, and they thought, wouldn't it be great? I mean, this guy is so amazing. He's claiming to be God in the flesh, and I'd love to, I'd love to just talk with him. I'd love to connect with him. And maybe even Mary, maybe one like this, Mary's like, Martha, I mean, the whole town knows you can cook. I mean, Martha, that's when you cook, people come. Let's use that. Let's do that. Anything to connect. Let's do it. So Martha's like, hey, do you want to come over for a meal? And the disciples are, you want to go to Martha's house for the meal? A girl can cook. And I don't think that's the reason Jesus said yes, but Jesus says, yeah, I'd love to. So he comes over, and Martha's like, oh, Messiah is coming to my house. So immediately, all the prep, all this. By the way, let me just ask you a quick question. Is there something wrong? Is there something sinful about cooking? Is there, is there something wrong with hospitality? No, it, it, it's, it's a spiritual gift. So Martha was doing something good. She was doing something with good intentions. But she allowed her cooking and preparations to draw her away from the very reason that she was doing those preparations. Think about that for a second. Her whole intention in doing these preparations was so she could connect with Jesus. But she got so caught up in the preparations that she forgot to connect with Jesus. Not only that, it became a source of bitterness and quarreling between her sister. So something that started with good intentions of wanting to connect all of a sudden started interfering with the connection that she when it started conflict in the home. She just wanted to connect. When do you allow good intentions to become a distraction in your life? Think about it. Some of us, we've got something, it might have to do with this screen right here. For some of us, it could be something else. In ministry, we see this all the time. I hate to say it, but we see sometimes people so caught up in the organization of the service, they forget what they're there for. We're so worried about getting all the preps perfect. And, and, and people like me, I'm like this very type A OC. I mean, everything has to be perfect. And I get sometimes so caught up in the prep, I forget about, I mean, I've seen this in youth ministry. We're working, we're prepping, and a kid comes up, hey, I need to talk. I can't. I've got, a, I've got worship practice. I've got this and that. And the kid's like, I, I need to talk. That's what you're there for, for kids that need to talk. And in some of our homes, there's a kid there, and you know what? They're not saying, Dad, I need to talk, but they need to talk. They really need to talk. And you know who they're talking to? I'm going to show you this afternoon who they're talking to, and it's scary. And we need to start thinking about this because sometimes we allow things to become distractions in our lives and it's things that we entered into with very good intentions. Matter of fact, if some of you were to just kind of fill that blank, 
Sometimes I allow blank, fill it in, to become a distraction in my life. What is that? I uh, wrote a book to young men um, a year ago, and it's called The Guy's Guide to Four Battles, and it talks about some of the distractions in our lives. And in a world where 79% of young men bring a device into their bedroom every night, we've got a lot of young men that just maybe are watching a YouTube video, innocent enough, and it's just, it's just kind of leads them down a rabbit hole of distractions. The battle of sexual temptation. Um, we got to talk with our kids about this. More on that this afternoon. So what does Jesus say? I said, let's hit the pause button. Let's see what Jesus does. We ended with Martha saying, she, it was obvious that Martha was distracted by the preparations that had to be made. And she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And I love this because when you go back to the passage here and you read what Jesus says, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about so many things. How many of you, that's you right there. You're worried and upset about so many things. But few things are needed or indeed only one. Some translations say just one thing. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Uh, here's a modern translation of that. Martha comes up to Jesus. Jesus, come on. I'm trying to prep and all this different stuff, and she's not helping me. Tell her to help me. Jesus, Martha, Martha, chill. Order some pizza. <laughs> Sit down, let's talk. The very thing that she wanted to do was what her sister was doing. And Jesus says, no, Jesus doesn't even say, he, he didn't say, here's what you need to do. And here, let me spell it out for you. He goes, you're worried and upset about so many things, but few things are needed, only one thing. What thing? He doesn't even say what it is. Mary has chosen what is better, and it's not going to be taken away from her. Mary's doing the one thing. You know what it is. I don't even have to say it. Order some pizza and let's hang out. Let's connect. See, so many of us, uh, we're so worried about the details, we miss the main event. I'm uh, going to be uh, doing the wedding for a young couple. It was a daughter who was one of my, uh, my, it was a friend of one of my daughters who grew up in our house. She was over for dinner and stuff. She's getting married and um, to this nice young man. And so I'm doing the marriage counseling and, and I marry them in a month. Uh, and when I'm performing the ceremony, uh, uh, I said, I'd be happy to perform the ceremony, but we're going to meet beforehand and we're going to talk. And as we were talking beforehand, I said, hey, let me just tell you something that I've observed because I've done lots of, as a minister, I've done lots of weddings. And here's one thing I've observed. I've observed that so many brides get so caught up in the details of the day and they get so anxious that everything has to be perfect that some brides actually have an ulcer and are drinking like you know stuff to, to calm their stomach the day of because every detail has to be so perfect and they're so caught up in the details that they miss enjoying the day um my wife and i uh, are both type a people and we do that all the time and we just celebrated 30 years together and last year was a really bad year I won't even go into details, but last year was a rough year for our family. A, de a death of a loved one, and it just rocked our world. Um, my grandson was born um, yeah, with, without a dad. Um, so it's been a tough year. And it's interesting, when tough things happen, people are like tea bags. You put them in hot water, and you see what really comes out. And a lot of stuff came out in our family, and it was a tough year. Um, by God's grace... Uh, the tough year drove me to my knees, drove me to just, God, I need you so bad. And uh, it was cool because when 30 years rolled around at the beginning of this year, my wife and I were able to celebrate 30 years and we're like, let's, let's celebrate it special. Let's go to the same place we were married. We went back to the church we were married and we gathered just a few intimate friends and they said, let's just have a ceremony where we renew our vows. So we did it. 
And we opted to do something that was so out of personality for us. We just said, uh, and I used to make fun of people that do this. I pulled out a napkin and a pen, and I said, let's plan the ceremony. Okay, uh, we'll come in. We'll do this. We'll do this. Does that sound good? Okay, you do the vows. I'll do the vows. I literally told my friend, hey, we're going to play a song. Will you bring like a literally like the equivalent of an old boom box? Now it's like a, you know, it's a speaker with now a connection to the internet because technology has evolved. There are no boom boxes anymore. Kids are like, what's a boom box? Forget it. <laughs> they were awesome. <laughs> and so there we stand up and we have this very chill ceremony. And my wife and I were like, this was amazing. We stood up and we just pledged our love to each other. And we read some scripture we gave to her. Literally, when we walked in, she's like, where do we stand? I'm like, I don't know. You, you stand there. I'll stand here. I'm like, All right, cool. And we had to pray. Hey, why don't you guys come up here and let's, care, let's pray. I mean, we, we literally just did it like that. And it was so awesome. For some reason, less was more. Um, Martha allowed her work and preparations to become one thing instead of Jesus. Jesus said, one thing matters. One thing. It's funny, we, we, we hear that term used throughout Scripture, Philippians 3. Uh, Paul says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining towards what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Focus on Christ alone. Christ alone. And very often, a lot of us, we start to lose our focus. My friend Mark took me mountain bike riding. And when he took me mountain bike riding, um, Mark and his wife Amy coach mountain biking. They're amazing mountain bikers. I have a mountain bike. I like it, but I am not skilled at all. I just kind of like thought it sounded fun. And we go up to Lake Tahoe because I live in California, and Lake Tahoe is gorgeous. It's this deep blue lake surrounded by green pine trees. And there's these trails all through there. So we're up at Tahoe. We go up to these trails, and Mark says, okay, um, let me give you some advice today if you'd like to live. And I said, I'm listening. You got my attention. He says, okay, he goes, we're going to go on some pretty precarious trails today, and these trails will take some turns, and on one particular turn, he goes, there's kind of this vista point of the lake, and he goes, and we can't stop there because the trail's not safe there. We'll stop later. So when you see, if you see the lake off your don't look. Keep your eyes on the trail. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm going to be in front of you. He says, see, and he points to his hub of his back wheel, the very middle of his back wheel. He goes, keep your eyes on that hub right there. He goes, you take your eyes off that hub? He goes... You, you're going to just go off the edge, you know? And I'm like, okay, eyes on the hub, eyes on the hub. He goes, just focus on that one thing. He used those words, on that one thing. I'm like, okay. So I start riding, and I'm just, look at the hub, look at the hub, don't die. Look at the hub, don't die. Off the trails are beautiful, and I'm sitting there, I'm watching the hub, watch the hub, watch the hub. And we go, and we go on this one trail, and he turns left, and I turn left, and I could see out of my peripheral vision this deep, blue, open, gorgeous setting. And I'm sitting there, and I'm supposed to be looking at the hub, but something just, just, it was like a tractor beam. I was just like, oh. I was like, God, oh, it's so beautiful. Literally for like a split second, and Mark turned left, and I didn't. I just, whew, true story, right off the edge. And I'm dead today. No, okay, as I turn back, I look and I'm like, oh, darn. That's what I said. And I went off the edge, and there was this little Christmas tree right there. And I was like elf, man. I was like, Phew! And I grabbed onto the Christmas tree. Literally, my toe clips hung onto my bike. And I was like, Phew! my bike. And the Christmas tree goes, meow. And as I'm hanging down in the Christmas tree, I'm like, hold on, little tree. And the tree was like, dude, you need to ease up on the pizza, man. Maybe you need to switch to all protein or something. I was like, shut up, you're a tree. What do you know? Mark comes back, and I'm hanging, true story, from this tree off the edge. And Mark goes, you looked at the lake, didn't you? I'm like, it was so beautiful. Is there anything wrong with looking at a lake? No. 
but I was distracted. And sometimes there's distractions in our life that take us away from looking at the one thing. And Jesus makes it so clear in this passage that he wants to connect with us. And if you read scripture throughout scripture, there's two things that are so important. As a matter of fact, the whole Ten Commandments are based on this, our connection with him and our connections with the people around us. And sometimes we allow distractions in our life to distract us from those things. What is distracting you from connecting with who matters? What is distracting you from connecting with who matters? What do you need to trim? Um, my uh, book, Parenting Generation Scream, came out this week. And uh, I've been on, I, I do this podcast with Focus on the Family. I know the crew over there. Uh, if you listen to Christian Radio, maybe you've listened to Jim Daly do his broadcast. And I was recording a broadcast, which, by the way, this Tuesday, I'll be on the Focus Family broadcast talking about that book. And these guys are really a lot of fun. And we always end up talking and, and goofing around. Uh, but one of the things that's fun is sometimes before the recording, we'll be talking. And one thing that John Fuller, uh, who's co-host of the show, asked, he said, tell me in the book, tell me about this connection before correction. It's a phrase I use throughout the book, connection before correction. And I said, uh, and, and I'm going to give you guys just a quick peek, because this afternoon, as I'm talking about five tips for parents and for grandparents and for those of us who care about Generation Screen, uh, this afternoon when I talk about that, uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about is this connection before correction. And that's because we have this tendency sometimes when we see a younger generation acting out in a certain way to jump on and correct. And what this concept simply is, and I outlined in the chapter early on in the book, and I actually confessed to these two guys. I said, hey, in all honesty, when Focus talked to me about writing this book, I know that what most parents are looking for in a book is, tell me how to set those boundaries. Tell me what blocks I can put on this device so they won't watch the bad stuff. And show me all those that, and, and, and a lot of us sit there and think that if we put the appropriate blocks on the devices, they're going to raise our kids for us. And I said, uh, in the book, I use this as an opportunity, and sure, I give them all the, here's some great blocks and this and that. I said, but guess what? All those blocks in the world, first of all, ain't going to block everything. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to say, you can block at the router level. You can block everything. And nothing's going to stop your, friend, your kid's friend from walking up and saying, hey, check this out. What, do you have a drone that follows your kid around that zaps their friends with lasers or something? like? That? It, it doesn't exist, all right? Although I know there's a Christian somewhere marketing that thing, you know. It doesn't work that way. We actually need to teach our kids to make decisions on their own so that someday when they're in a college dorm and when they're in army barracks and they're on their own and they're deciding whether or not to stream that HBO show or not, the question we should ask ourselves is, have we equipped them for that day? Or do we just try to block everything out? And then when they're 18, they're like, woohoo! I'm free! And a lot of it is from this process of connection before correction. Um, he said, I, I had some books out there. I'll tell you, I, I, I got some books out at the book table. If you're interested, I brought my Parenting Generation screen, and uh, I brought a handful of these parenting books um, that, uh, th that are available out there, and I put them in a pack. Um, these are all, I know they're going to sell out, so I, they're also on Amazon. I tried to discount them a little bit more. Um, I've also got books for teenagers, and I'll just tell you this. The thing about the books for teenagers is at the end of every chapter, I include discussion questions because my goal is that you wouldn't just hand this, even though this book right here is the book that a lot of parents are saying, hey, when you read this book, now you can get social media. It's the driver's manual. Um, I put discussion questions at the end because my goal is that dad or mom can take their kid to breakfast and be like, hey, let's talk about the book. And that's why I put discussion questions at the end of every chapter. Even this theologically correct book right there, the Zombie Apocalypse Survival Guide for Teenagers. All this is is a story of three teenagers surviving in a post-apocalyptic world. And in every situation they get into, they're asking, what is the right thing to do? A mm, little bit of scripture. Um, so I've got those there, and uh, I've got those available. But um, this morning, 
Uh, and by the way, and I hope you come back at uh, this afternoon for Parenting Generation Screen because we're going to dive in a lot deeper. Um, this is a lot this morning. Um, I want to pray us out. So let's pray about this, and I want to talk about these. Uh, let's talk to the Lord and bring these distractions to him. Lord God, I thank you so much for your love, and I thank you for your grace in our lives because as we sit here as, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts, uncles, people who care about this younger generation, and even some of the younger generation sitting here, Lord God, we are imperfect people. And the one thing that is so evident when we really look at our own lives is how much we need you. And Lord God, every single one of us needs your grace and needs your love. And every single one of us really needs to be sitting at your feet just soaking you in. And we get so distracted. Sometimes we get distracted because we're like Martha, not just distracted by the preparations, but we're distracted because somebody else isn't doing what we want them to be doing. And Lord God, we need you to just ask us to focus on you and to sit down at your feet and soak you in. Lord God, there's also many of us here that there's something in our life that does not belong there and we need it removed. And maybe we've tried to avoid that distraction before, but it is... Uh, it's still there. God, um, only you can remove that. Lord God, I pray that if we have that, maybe that thing that we would have written down in that blank, boom, we know what that is, that does not belong there in our life. Lord God, take that from us. And Lord God, if there's something there that has been difficult to remove, I pray that if for us there's something there that needs to be removed that we would verbalize that to someone today. We would say, mom, dad, uh, to your spouse, to your friend, to a pastor. I prayed because I've got something there that is distracting me right now, and here's what it is. And, tell, and God, we need to tell somebody about it. So God, we, uh, we give that to you right now. God, I pray that as we uh, today think about these issues, that you would just speak to us. Um, and I pray these things in your precious name. All God's people said, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you all give him a hand? <laughs> Amen. Well, that was just the opening session for our Parenting Forward uh, conference, and Jonathan McKee will be back again at 4.30 p.m. here, I believe, in the uh, sanctuary. Uh, is it in here? Okay, we'll be in here. And uh, for our Parenting Generation Screen Workshop, like you said, five practical tips on how to engage and interact. It's going to be awesome. You can catch him at his table. Jonathan, we'll go ahead and ask for you to, to head to that table in the lobby. So there. And uh, I just wanted to, to kind of give some, some follow-up just so that you guys are aware. Obviously, we're about to go into our next session, which is our, our normal worship service. So if you are in choir, you may want to go ahead and ease on out. And uh, otherwise, I'm just, like I said, giving a few wrap-up details. However, during that service, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Alan Branch, who is um, a professor of ethics from Midwestern. And he's going to be speaking on God's design for marriage in this next uh, session. So we really invite you guys to stick around and then to come back at 4.30 for a Parenting Generation Screen Workshop and then 6 p.m. when Dr. Alan Branch will be returning to discuss the ideas of transgenderism and scripture, which can be a very practical talk for you as well. Also, you will notice that next door to our uh, table for Jonathan McKee, you're going to see a table with some books on there. Just one book. There's just a bunch of them. All right. And that's our family guide. It's a practical guide. We've got one right here so you can see an example. Our Parenting Forward, a family guide to gender and sexuality. Uh, we as a staff, we put this together after a lot of thought, a lot of study for you. It's totally free. In it, you're going to find not only um, us kind of walking through some of scripture as it looks towards the ideas of transgenderism and the LGBTQ plus culture. And a lot of what you're going to find in here was in fact um, inspired by one of Dr. Allen Branch's books, Affirming God's Image. Um, which hopefully he might even mention to you guys about either this morning or even tonight, okay? So either way, these are totally free. They've got some, some guides on how to talk to elementary age, uh, age kids, preschool age kids, and uh, students. And in the back, 
You will find an FAQ with all kinds of questions that we have sought to answer as biblically and straightforward and clearly as possible. So that's going to be for every single one of you, totally free, uh, in front of the bookstores where you'll find that. Finally, at 4.30 p.m., our next session with Jonathan McKee, we're going to have a free copy of one of his books for the first 100 families that come. So make sure that you guys do, in fact, return for that. And if you have kids, make sure to hop on and register your children for the child care, which is going to be insanely awesome. Inflatables, meal, and, uh, and some movies, some, some games. It's going to be awesome. Trust me. All right. So with that being said, y'all are dismissed, and we hope to see you guys again in the next sessions.